everyone. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, we're very pleased to have Anthony Samarco here. This is his second time here, and the first time was so fabulous that we had to have him back wow. to do the talk on the history of Jordan Marsh Company. So thanks again, Anthony, for being here. He has some wonderful books that will be for sale after the talk, and I understand that you may autograph them. If Anybody would like it, I'm sure I will. I know I would. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. And please turn off your cell phones if you have one, and there's coffee and water in the back. Thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone. I, the books that you mentioned, uh, I, I just had two new ones come out. One is Halloween Traditions in Boston, and the other is Inferno, the Great Boston Fire of 1872. During the year, I've been writing. I retired last year, 42 years in finance. So I still teach at BU Metropolitan College, but normally now I basically work on the books until around 10 when I'm told to go out to the garden and do something. <laughs> Today, at least, it was raining, so I got to stay inside. But this is a lecture on Howard Johnson's, which was something that everyone seemed to know. It had an orange roof and turquoise blue shutters. It went from Maine to Florida and from the East Coast to the West. It was known for its fried clams and grilled frankfurters. And it was something that middle-class Americans not only realized was delicious food, but it had sensible prices. Has anybody ever been to a Howard Johnson's? Of course. And some of us not only worked there, but some of us knew them. And I think in some ways we also knew their 28 flavors of ice cream. There was something for every palate. Well, seen here, the cover of the book, which is called A History of Howard Johnson's, How a Massachusetts Soda Fountain Became an American Icon, which I did not name, my publisher did, is something in some ways that chronicles a store that started in 1925 and would continue until 1979 when it was eventually sold to Imperial Group, which was a British conglomerate. In some ways, Howard Johnson's was something that was a rite of passage. From the time we were children, when they served ice cream and lollipops, right through to today, when we actually have a wonderful memory. But in a lot of ways, people realize in some ways that the name is Howard Johnson's. And it was named for this man. Howard Deering Johnson was born in Dorchester in 1899. A year later, they moved to Wollaston, which is a part of Quincy. And there he was raised, and he actually would complete the eighth grade before he had to drop out of school to assist his father in the business. He served in World War I, and after 1921 became a cigar jobber. But by 1925, he started a simple corner store that not only provided ice cream, but all sorts of things such as cigarettes and cigars and newspapers and magazines, and he became a multimillionaire. He was somebody in some ways that also branded his company. And seen here in a watercolor etching that was done in 1935, the logo at something was created by a man named John Alcott. He was a graphic designer from Islington, which is a part of Westwood. He had many clients, but in 1935 he met with Howard Johnson and saw on his desk a small tin, and it was actually boiled candy. And on the tin on the four sides was simple pie, Simon and the Pieman. He actually took that and added a drooling dog. That became the logo of Howard Johnson. So the company was branded in that aspect with the aspect of, of course, this icon. But he also created the font of Howard Johnson's as well as the colors, the orange and the blue. Well, during that period, Howard Johnson himself would also solidify the base. He had three children. The first was Dorothy, who actually was born in 1929. His son, Howard, who was born in 1937, and a little boy named Timmy. Howard himself, seen here in a photograph of about 1941 or two, was somebody who not only knew his father, but he had been primed as a child to actually take over the business. And the business was doing quite well, even during the Depression. When it was started in Wollaston, which is a part of the city of Quincy, it was in an area of Beale Street, which was actually adjacent to the Old Colony Railroad. Now, seen here in a postcard, and this is about 1915, the corner store itself was an important feature because originally it was the Walker Barlow Drug Store. 
And he actually would purchase this in 1925 with a loan from his widowed mother, as well as a loan of $2,000 from Dr. George Dalton, who was an internist at Quincy City Hospital. In that way, when he opened, he was really providing things for the people who were commuting to Boston for business. In the very center is the Wollaston Depot of the old granite branch of the old Colony Railroad. And in that instance, Quincy, because of the railroad, would grow tremendously. From 1882, when it had become a city, by 1925 it had tripled in population. And Howard Johnson, as I mentioned, did provide everything that people could possibly need. Cigars, cigarettes, newspapers, magazines, and of course, three flavors of ice cream. With that drugstore came a counter, and this marble counter would actually be reused by Howard Johnson, not only to provide the ice cream, but also to provide floats and sodas and fraps. He worked with a man on the left-hand side whose name is Everett Porter, beginning in 1926 for over 40 years. Everett Porter and he began to experiment by making ice cream. Now, previous to this time, he had been providing ice cream that was simply delivered, and it was probably quite good, but he wanted something that was a little better than what he was actually serving. He also wanted something that actually had all natural ingredients. So during the period of 1926, they experimented with French freezers. Now, have you ever made ice cream and, or had it served to you and it has shards of ice in it? I kind of like it. But Howard Johnson wanted to make it into a rich, creamy, delicious ice cream. Well, he continued to make this according to his mother's ice cream recipe. After many attempts, they realized in some ways that something was wrong. They actually approached a man by the name of William Halbauer that would live in Nahant, Massachusetts. Now, they had been serving the ice cream, and people seemed to enjoy it, as well as light breakfasts and light lunches. But Halbauer was somebody who actually had an ice cream stand at Nahant Beach. He was a German immigrant. He had come to this country in the 1880s. And since that time, he was actually serving what was said to be the best ice cream and college ices or sherbet in the Boston area. People couldn't imagine that he was doing this for 10 cents. And seen just to the right of the doorway, Halbauer was approached by Howard Johnson. Now, in 1927, he had to realize in some ways Nahant was a little bit of a ride. And when he got there, Halbauer said, of course I can help you, but you actually have a recipe that I can sell to you for $300. Well, in 1927, $300 is a considerable sum of money. And when Howard Johnson got the recipe, it really didn't differ from his mother's ice cream recipe at all. The only difference was that it had an 18% butterfat count. Now, at that time, the FDA required ice cream to have an 11% butter count. But in this instance, Howard Johnson said, if it's as good as Halbauer's, I'm going to make it 18%. And with all natural ingredients, he created 28 flavors of ice cream, something for every palate. And in that instance, his ice cream cones, seen here in an advertisement of 1931, showed 28 delicious flavors, beginning with apple, a vanilla, and going all the way down to pineapple. It wasn't alphabetical, but at 10 cents a cone, it was larger than anyone else's. Not only was it rich and creamy and smooth, but it was probably the most fattening ice cream that was on the market. It was also the fact, in some instances, because they beat it so much with air, it had volume. Well, Howard Johnson, as he said, made his ice cream by a Yankee for discriminating Yankees. And during that period, not only was he selling tremendous amounts at the store in Wollaston, but in 1928, he would actually rent a small shack on Wollaston Beach for the summer. Wollaston Beach had become an area during the period of the early 20th century, much like Revere Beach. It was a public beach, and people began to go, not just during the week, but even weekends. And seen here in a postcard of about 1910, there were not only residences on the right side all the way up to Han Hancock Street, but the area of the beach attracted thousands of people. Well, by 1928, 
that small shack that Howard Johnson had rented for the summer for $500 was something that he not only served his grilled frankfurters, he also served water and ice cream, 28 flavors, but he was somebody in some ways that began to realize that by the larger the cone at 10 cents, he was able to corner the market. And it was said that on one Saturday, in August of 1928, there were over 10,000 people queuing in line for an ice cream cone, and the Quincy Police Department had to be called out. Well, this was so successful, the following year he opened one at Natasca Beach and also Revere Beach. Howard Johnson was moving on towards success, and by 1929, he wanted to open his own uh, restaurant. Though the store had been very profitable, it was very good, and the little ice cream stands profitable, this idea of a colonial-themed restaurant was something that had been in his mind for many years. He decided to open it at Quincy Square, and seen here in a postcard of about 1950, on the left is the Church of the Presidents, where not only John, but John Quincy Adams actually worshipped and are buried, and on the right-hand side, Quincy City Hall. But in the distance was the Granite Trust Bank. Now, the Granite Trust Bank had been founded in 1825. It was actually done in such a way to both finance and also provide banking services for employees in the granite industry. And during that period, it had done extremely well. And by this period, in 1928, they built an 11-story bank. The bank itself not only had the offices from the 2nd through the 11th floor, but it was the tallest building on the south shore of Massachusetts. To offset costs on either side of the front entrance, they had rental space on the ground floor. And you can might see just to the left the Howard Johnson name. Howard Johnson met with Theophilus uh, Perkins, a man who was the president of not only the Granite Trust, but a very wealthy financier on the South Shore. He gave him a $50,000 line of credit, which was a huge sum of money. And in that instance, not only did he remodel the basement into a kitchen, but he made the upstairs into the colonial dining room, where he would actually serve old-fashioned type foods. He hired a woman by the name of Virginia Church. She's probably somebody you've never heard of, but she and her husband would eventually write Bows and Church Caloric Guide. I'm sure you have that caloric guide on your refrigerator, too. I just want to know what it's eating and how many calories it is. But during that period, her husband was studying at the Harvard Medical School, and she was a trained dietitian. And she worked with Howard Johnson to create not only attractive and delicious foods, but also something that might be accepted by the population. She would go on to make things such as not only roast turkey, macaroni and cheese, not only chicken curry, but a variety of dishes that Howard Johnson became well known for. Well, in this instance, this building itself was not only a profitable banking institution, but the colonial dining room with businessmen's lunches and dinners, as well as an ice cream stand that could actually provide a scoop of 28 flavors of ice cream was an immediate success. Howard Johnson actually got a great start because there was a play that was to be performed in Boston called Strange Interlude. Has anybody ever heard of this play? Well, Eugene O'Neill wrote the play, and it was a Pulitzer Prize winning play, but it was a little bit outré. It was something about a married couple, and the wife had a child out of wedlock that was not her husband's. So in this instance, it was something that was thought a little bit risque. Well, it was being performed in New York by the Theatre Guild, and of course, New York is New York. It had droves of people that would actually go to see it. Well, the mayor of Boston, Malcolm Nichols, decided to go to New York to see this play because it was supposed to come to Boston after its run in New York. And in that instance, after he had sat through this play, which was six and a half hours in length, the first thing he did was to call the New England Watch and Ward Society. He said not only was it immoral, but it was something that should not be performed in Boston. And the theater that was to actually allow them to perform canceled their reservation. 
Well, the Theater Guild had already sold advance tickets. They weren't going to refund the money. And they would actually petition almost every city and town in and around Boston to see if they could perform this. And everyone refused, except for Quincy. And if I go back, on the right-hand side was the Quincy Theater. And the Quincy Theater had started off as a silent movie house, later became vaudeville, and of course it had talking movies. But it had a stage. They would have performed there, and it was something that we realize now, if we have family or friends in Quincy, they're a little less moral than the rest of us. But the whole idea was the strange interlude was to be performed in Quincy, not in downtown Boston. People would come out in dinner jackets and evening gowns on the granite branch of the Old Colony Railroad to Quincy Square. And of course, because it was a six and a half hour length play, they didn't have an intermission, they had a dinner break. And the only place to go was Howard Johnson's. In that instance, his 50 cent businessman's dinners went up to a dollar fifty. And after seven weeks, he was raking in the money. When they left in the third week of October, Howard Johnson said, I'm set. This has done extremely well, and I know the business will succeed. The next Friday was Black Friday, and the Great Depression descended upon not just Quincy and Howard Johnson, but the entire country. And in that instance, Howard Johnson, with a widowed mother and two unmarried sisters and a wife, was somebody who had to try to sustain the business, and actually many people who were not dining out, let alone eating ice cream during the Depression, realized in some ways that this was going to be a difficult feat. Well, by the early part of 1930, Howard Johnson met with his friend Reginald Heber Sprague. Sprague was a businessman, a heavy hit by the Depression, but he had a house in Wollaston and property in Easton on Cape Cod. And they began to discuss the idea of actually having a franchise of Howard Johnson's restaurant in Quincy. Everyone loved it when they had money. Maybe they would like it on the Cape. Many people still had enough money to go away for a week during the summer months. And Sprague, whose family had a huge piece of land at the junction of Route 28 and 6A, in Easton, as you come in from Orleans, is a great example in some ways of a man who was resourceful. His father lived in the mansion, and of course they decided to lease the property to Howard Johnson, where he would open the first restaurant franchise in the United States. Now this was on the corner of the property, and you can see a corner of the house on the far right-hand side. You might know this today as the Christmas tree shop. <laughs> It's a wonderful white stucco mansion, but it's also something in some ways that they have a restaurant right in front called the Bulldog Pub. Well, that is the Howard Johnson building, built in 1935. Not only was it only opened nine months out of the year, but within two years, Reginald Sprague was able to pay back his $17,000 debt for the land and building and, of course, all of the operating costs in such a way that he was a profitable man. The building itself spurred on other franchises. And during the 1930s, they began to sprang up, bless you, as if by magic. Dorchester also opened in June of 1935, and this was on what is today Morrissey Boulevard. But if we realize, a few years before the Southeast Expressway was built, this was on the Old Colony Parkway, the only way in or out of Boston. And the parkway was a major feature because with a restaurant, people might stop simply for a cup of coffee and a piece of pie, or dinner, or just an ice cream cone. But these began to actually show the prototype, an orange roof and also a wonderful neon marquee directly in front. During the day, if you couldn't see that orange roof from a mile away, or in the evening you couldn't see the neon-lit marquee, you had to have an eye check. Howard Johnson's restaurants began to spring up at every intersection. This is Wellington Circle in Medford, Massachusetts, built in 1937. A major feature with a hundred parking spaces, with roads that went to Medford, to Somerville, to Everett and Chelsea, and Charlestown in Boston. People began to realize on a crossroad, one would always find a Howard Johnson. 
But the company was also doing well because of advertising and marketing. And this is John Alcott Eagles. As I mentioned earlier, he was the graphic designer that created the logo, Simple Simon and the Drooling Dog. He was a very successful man. He taught at RISD, but he was also somebody that had hundreds of advertising clients. But Howard Johnson's was the largest. He would work with them from 1935 until his death in 1971. And it was he who would brand the business, the logo, the roof that was orange and the turquoise blue shutters, as well as the fact that Simple Simon and the Pieman appeared on every dinner plate, cup and saucer, and even swizzle sticks. But it wasn't just Alcott. It was also Howard Johnson's friends. Does anybody recognize this woman? Her name is Sister Parrish, and eventually in the 1950s and 60s, she'd go on to have one of the most successful design companies in the United States, Parrish Hadley. She worked with Jacqueline Kennedy when she restored the White House, and she was somebody who had to go to work after the Depression. Somebody who was not only raised with servants, but she and her husband had a huge house on Long Island that actually was said to have had at one time 40 servants, was reduced to working. Well, she decided to go into the design business for those of her friends that didn't lose all their money, and she'd rearrange and do all sorts of things to their houses. Well, Howard Johnson had met her and seemed to enjoy her company. He asked her to design a new waitress uniform for his waitresses, and she created something that was teal green with white cuffs and collar and cap and apron. And during that period, it was very successful. And he said, sister, how much do I owe you? And she said, you don't owe me a cent but I'll take a lifetime supply of ice cream. <laughs> and in that instant, she was somebody who would actually eat that ice cream until her death in 1975. But seen here with a Sister Parish designed waitress uniforms. These women stand on either side of a banquet. The dining rooms themselves were similar, but not exact. Though Howard Johnson had five architects on call at any given time, they would actually use it in a way for whatever the spot and location warranted. But the interior also had wide plank pine paneling, and it was from Frank Curry and Company, a woodworking concern in Boston South End, and the tile roof was actually provided by Frank Pemberton, a company that was in Quincy. In that instance, these two good friends, like Sister Parrish, worked with Howard Johnson right through to the 1960s. And in that instance, many people realized that Howard Johnson's famous 28 flavors was not just a cachet, but they really did have 28 at any given time flavors, which appeal to every palate. I love this one. It starts with apple, it goes to butter pecan, chocolate, chocolate chip, coconut, fruit salad, but then you also have grape nut ice cream, as well as all sorts of different nuts. Many people realize that this young man with four sugar cones in his hands, scooping from the freezer, would actually provide some of the best ice cream at that time, which was premium ice cream before we even knew the term premium. There was also the fact that Alcott would do these wonderful full-page advertisements in nationwide magazines, like Look and Life magazine. And it shows a young man behind the counter, look at the scoop in his hand. It was specially designed for Howard Johnson, conical with the top cut off, which would allow for a larger neck. And these three children look at the sign. Well, the sign actually has all of the different 28 flavors, and they did differ regionally. New England's might differ from Florida, and consequently the West Coast. But these three children say the wonderful world of 28 flavors of Howard Johnson's. But these weren't just any children, they were Howard Johnson's. Since they were children, he utilized them in his marketing and advertising campaigns, and of course with smiles, it translated into sales. Now the children, as you can see here, one is eating an ice cream sundae, the daughter Dorothy is drinking an ice cream float, and then an ice cream cone. Not only did they enjoy it, as we would, but they were also part of the aspect of advertising on billboards. During the early 1940s, 
Howard Johnson had gotten the concession for major roads in the United States. So on the Massachusetts Turnpike, the New York Thruway, the New Jersey Thruway, the Ohio Turnpike, and the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he would actually not only have restaurants with clean facilities, but he was adjacent to the Esso fueling station. So you could fuel your car and then stop for something while you were waiting. And of course, at every single billboard would have the children, and they said, we love our daddy's ice cream, and so too won't you. And that did translate into these sales, and people stopped, whether it was, as I said, for coffee or tea, or even ice cream or dinner. Well, Howard Johnson, seen here in 1938, had done extremely well. By 1938, still at the height of the Depression, he was worth over a hundred, uh, over one million dollars. And that was actually something you realize that was net after expenses. He had bought a house in 1934 on Summit Avenue in Wollaston, a beautiful area that still overlooks the city of Boston, but it was simple. It was only a six bedroom house and three bathrooms. And here, his children would actually sit with him while he read to them a history of Howard Johnson's. Now remember, this is 1938. The company was only started in 1925, and I don't know how much went on over 13 years, but I have a copy of this book. It's three pages in length, and it's triple-spaced. But the other 37 pages are a list of every restaurant, franchise, and ice cream stand in the United States. This man was somewhat of a Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. In this period, his children were living with him, but they decided in some ways to send them to school. The daughter went to Dana Hall, and the boy eventually boarded at Phillips Andover. During 1939, he would buy a house in Milton, the next town over, and it was on Brush Hill Road, still a very rural area of Milton. The house had been built as a weekend house by Norwood Penrose Hallowell, a wealthy financier in Boston. His children were boarding at Milton Academy, and he built this house so they could actually have home cooking on Saturdays and Sundays. In that instance, it was an eight-bedroom house, 14 acres of land, eight-car garage, tennis courts, swimming pool, and Howard Johnson bought it for $19,000. But he didn't use it to actually live there, though he had a butler, a cook, a housekeeper, and two live-in maids. He bought this as a business, and he wanted to use this house as a tax deduction because he wanted to sell franchises. So on the back lawn, he erected marquees. On the upper left-hand side, you can see an edge of the canvas marquee. And the marquee was larger than this room, and he would actually invite prospective people who might buy a franchise. Now, in the 1940s, a franchise was above $4,000, but so too wasn't a very nice house. And in that instance, many people looked at the franchise as something like Reginald Heber Sprague. They could not only make a profit, but a very good living. Well, Many of these people came with their wives or husbands because there were many women that would buy franchises as well as the men. And seen here in the center, Howard Johnson in his rep tie and of course blue blazer has two men on either side. The man on the left with the glasses is Irving Cotter. He did buy one and he actually opened it in Fairfield, Connecticut and was running it as late as 1971 when he died. But do you see the man on the right with his hands in front of him? It's George Larson. And George Larson, as you can see by the demeanor on his face, was somewhat quizzical. And he actually did buy a franchise, but he didn't like the idea that he could only sell Howard Johnson produced foods and ice cream. He had commissaries both in Wollaston, Taunton, Brockton, and Rego Park, New York. And these franchisees had to sign an agreement that they would serve nothing other than the food provided by Howard Johnson, even if Aunt Maud's coconut cake was the best you had ever tasted. Well, he did make a small profit, and he opened it in Wellesley Square. But two years later, he sold it back to Howard Johnson for the $4,000. 
and he decided to open his own restaurant, which was the Pillar House on Route 128. So many of these people were well-trained and capable, but Howard Johnson during that period would even have an article that actually talked about his business in Fortune magazine. And seen here in 1940, this was a 12-page uh, article, and it said, who is Howard Johnson? Everyone knew the name of Howard Johnson. It was on every roadside ice cream stand and restaurant, but they actually even used color photographs. This disembodied hand, it says, it's the boss, it's my favorite. Well, this hand holds a chocolate ice cream cone. But this isn't any chocolate ice cream. This is ice cream with 18% butter fat and real Belgian fudge. It was the best chocolate ice cream on the market. And people could, couldn't understand, and they marveled at the fact that the ice cream was so good. Well, during that period, the article went on in great detail about him and his operation. How is it that this man, with an eighth grade education, was able by 1940, just at the beginning of the recovery period because of World War II coming up, to actually see the economy recovering, say in some ways that these men, line cooks, cook by Johnson's book? Well, these men not only cooked by Johnson's book, but we also began to realize in some ways that that book was an employee manual. So if you knew your job, and you knew your job, and I knew my job, we could work as a team to create something that was not only profitable, but hopefully something that provided good food and good company. And in that way, there were even people such as statisticians. Because if you did buy a franchise, you were required to go to the Howard Johnson Institute. It was an eight-week course, 40 hours a week, and you learned how to run a restaurant. And in this instance, the man on the right-hand side was the statistician. And he would actually teach you how to do food so that it looked good as well as actually being cost-effective. He would tell these young men, make a dinner plate. Well, the food was there. They'd simply make a plate. Maybe it was roast turkey and mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce and a vegetable. And, or maybe it was actually fried clams and French fries and coleslaw. The whole idea was the amount of food you put on that plate could predicate the fact whether it was a profit or a loss. A few too many French fries, a few too many clams. In that instance, if you did it repeatedly, every day, every week, at the end of the month, you cut into profits. Howard Johnson suggested a nice piece of curly parsley because it would take up about a tenth of the plate. It looked pretty, but in that instance, it cut down on the amount of food you had to put on a plate. Well, Howard Johnson, in a lot of ways, was really quite an astute man. But not only did he own outright some of his restaurants, but many of them, at least two-thirds, were franchises. In 1938, he decided to open a franchise that he went to business with a woman by the name of Lydia Gove. This was to be the largest roadside restaurant in the United States. It was opened in Rigo Park, New York, on Jamaica Way, and it was something that would actually seat 1,100 people at any given time. It also had the largest orange roof in the world. But the building, as you can see here, was built because of the New York World's Fair, which was to open in 1939 and run for two years to actually show the recovery from the Depression, but also all sorts of things that dealt with energy as well as architecture and all sorts of new ideas. And you can see on the upper left-hand side part of the World's Fair headquarters, but if you were going, you had to pass by the front of Howard Johnson's. So whether you were walking on a bicycle, on a bus, car, you actually had to pass. Now this was something in a lot of ways that many people began to realize it was something, why not? It's ice cream, it's wonderful foods. But this was something that he worked in unison with this woman, Lydia Gove. Has anybody ever heard of Lydia Gove? Well, Lydia Gove had been born in Boston. She was educated at Mount Holyoke and Radcliffe for her masters. And her father and she served as president and treasurer 
of the Lydia Pinkham Company, which was started by her Quaker grandmother in Salem. Now, during the period of the 19th century, Mrs. Gove's grandmother, Lydia Pinkham, created a medicine. And the medicine was something that was supposed to cure every female ailment. And because it was 98% alcohol, it probably cured every male uh, ailment as well. It survived FDA scrutiny, but the whole idea was she was making $300,000 a year at the height of the Depression. She bought one franchise in New York, but this second one cost her $300,000. It was a huge sum of money. She was somebody who was a great philanthropist. She also provided money for young women to be educated. And she was also an aficionado of air flight and was said to have been one of the first women to fly from Boston to the West Coast. But seen here on opening night, they invited 400 of their nearest and dearest. And in the very center is Howard Johnson in white tie and tails. And on the left-hand side is Lydia Gove. These people like the marquees that was set up as a franchisee, would actually have open bars at every corner of the restaurant. But when they sat to dinner, they ordered off the menu. And people began to realize that some Howard Johnsons might serve things as not only lobster thermidor and wonderful cuts of meat and pork chops, but it was something you realized there was something again for every palate. And these people, who basically looked at Howard Johnson's as a fast food restaurant, realized that this was open between 5 a.m. and 1 a.m. daily, and people loved it. The two of them even created a coin. And this coin, about the size of a silver dollar, and it was gold in color, had on the obverse, New York World's Fair, 1939. And on the reverse was, of course, Simple Simon and the Pieman and the Drooling Dog. It had no monetary value at all. But if you had one of these coins and you were passing by the Rigo Park restaurant, you had 10% off your bill. What an inducement to stop. Well, the coins, to the tune of over 20,000 that were minted, were said to have had over a 2 million turn each year. And at 10%, you can imagine what they were grossing on food. It was so successful that one saw the orange roof during the day, but in the evening, there was a 28-foot-high colored neon light. This marquee, as you can see at the top, had the logo. It said Howard Johnson's 28 flavors of ice cream. They had a grill, a cocktail lounge, special luncheons, steaks, chops, chicken, fried clams, and special frankfurts. These weren't hot dogs. These were grilled frankfurts in creamery butter served in a toasted roll. Everybody began to realize that Howard Johnson's was really the best place to go. Seen here, this is on Route 138 in the Canton-Milton line, it became the prototype for the business. A colonial revival, one-story um, building, orange roof, cupola that was lit from within with a clock and a weather vane of Simple Simon and the Pieman. But now they were coming with automobile parking. The ascendancy of the automobile in the late 30s and 1940s was a major factor that made Howard Johnson's as successful as it became. But it was also the fact that they began to be opened in all parts of not just Massachusetts, but the country. And seen here at the Bourne Bridge, which I just came across, Howard Johnson's was located there. So when you arrived, maybe you got the first Ipswich fried clams and French fries, or you wanted to stop one last time before you left the Cape for an ice cream sundae. Howard Johnson had sensible prices but it was also to become America's choice. This restaurant, which was truly a fast food restaurant, was something that became beloved by people. It was not only the fact that adults liked it, but it was a family-friendly restaurant. And this waitress, holding a menu of delicious food that also had daily specials, but also the old standbys, would be augmented by a menu for children. In 1937, Howard Johnson had created this menu for children that not only had foods that were attractive and palatable to children, but they were child size in portion and child size in price. 
And in that instance, during the 1930s and 40s, children could come in and order things such as the Jack Spratt plate. I love this. Orange juice, a post egg, a poached egg on toast, chocolate or plain milk for 55 cents. Or they might want the Jack and Jill. It was actually a golden brown fish fillet, mashed potatoes, fresh vegetable, buttered toast triangles, and ice cream for 85 cents. Or how about the Miss Muffet lunch? This was petite fresh vegetable plate, bacon strip, roll and butter, and ice cream and beverage for 75 cents. What child wouldn't like a menu just for them? But what parent or grandparent wouldn't like the fact that this was actually something more reasonably priced and sensible than the adult's menu? But of course, whoever was paying the bill would go to the cash register, and adjacent to it was the confectionery stand. Howard Johnson, as early as 1929, had begun to make chocolates. And seen here, these were white chocolate with a milk chocolate side that had things such as a whale or a ship or even simple Simon and the Pieman. And at 15 cents, they were very reasonable for the quality of the chocolate. Children by the 1960s would be given a menu on the back of a piece of paper. This is a simple piece of cardboard with circular spires that actually come into the logo. And it says, Simple Simon, Meta Pyman, going to the fair. On the obverse was the, me the menu that the child could place his or her order. But after they had placed it, they could then take that and put it on their head like a baseball cap. But if they went for breakfast they might actually become Mr. Pancake Face with the aid of twine or yarn. And we realized in some ways that the child could then put the mask on their face and entertain their family or torture the people in the next banquet. But the whole idea was children were welcomed. It was a family-friendly restaurant. And here, Howard Johnson's own children were part of that aspect. In a detail of a much larger advertisement from the late 1940s, Dorothy is seen in the center. She was always beautifully dressed, her hair was always combed neatly, and he hands her an ice cream cone and she smiles. But I think the boy received the wrong flavor. It's probably pistachio or something of that sort. But in that instance, these were the children that would actually say, we love our daddy's ice cream and so too won't you. But this man was somebody who was driven. He was a perfectionist. And he would show up at his commissaries in the middle of the night and say, serve me a dozen pies. Were the pies crusts as flaky as they should be? Was the filling as sweet and flavorful as he remembered from the last time? And he would simply taste test dozens of different types of foods. And it was said that he would even show up at the different franchises, go into the kitchen and open the refrigerators to check on the quality of the food and if anything had passed expiration date. One time he did that in Connecticut and he was arrested. And people said, who is this man? And they realized that it was Howard Johnson, but people didn't know who he was when he was arrested. But in a lot of ways, the advertisement said it all. In this advertisement, it said that Howard Johnson's was a haven for the folks, but it was heaven for the kids. And you see children coming on foot by scooter, pogo stick, walking stick, even perambulator to Howard Johnson's. In this instance, they even had teenagers. And these teenagers sit around a jalopy as one boy paints the 28 flavors of ice cream on the side, and of course, a young girl sits applying makeup. And she says, you men are all alike. It was, last night it was frankfurters and fried clams. But the boy in the back says, and don't forget, the piggyback prices and good for my money. In some ways, teenagers even loved it, difficult as they were. But even young married couples in 1950 arrive in this Cat, uh, convertible with a just married sign and the bride says to the groom can't you think of anything but 28 flavors mm -hmm. and the groom says thinking of an ice cream cone nothing except the frankfurters and fried clams the hurry up service and sensible prices young married couples were different 75 years ago and of course after a few children father with his receding hairline and smaller hat 
and mother with her three children approach a Howard Johnson's. And father says, 28 flavors, 28 flavors, 28 flavors. That's all I ever hear. And the little boy in the back says, and don't forget the frankfurters and fried clams or the piggyback prices. Everyone loved it, but so didn't bumblebees. And now bumblebees didn't come to actually pollinate plants. They came with a spoon to taste test the 28 flavors of ice cream that actually grew like ice cream cones in front of the restaurant. It truly was the landmark for hungry Americans. And people realized in some ways it was quality, sensibly priced, and it was totally reliable. Well, some of the things that he would actually institute, not only in his own restaurants, but the franchises, was on Mother's Day. He would say, serve every woman that arrived at the restaurant a dessert of their choice. And seen here, mother with her hat and pearls and corsage is served ice cream with fruits in season. It wasn't a huge gesture, but it was actually something that many people appreciated. And during World War II, he put a dictate that every restaurant had to serve a man or a woman in uniform a free meal. And in that way, it was something that it was a simple thing for their service. But many people did have their meals with their family before they were sent to whatever place they were going. And in that instance, it was something that people looked at Howard Johnson's as a great place. But this calling all appetites meant that people really did go to Howard Johnson's. And seen here, they came by foot, by horseback, convertible, automobile, bicycle, and even horse-drawn wagon. It was something people began to realize by 1950, with this restaurant of an orange roof, you could really get everything from breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and even late-night snacks. People loved it, but it was also their marketing that really made them as well-known. This is a card that they actually did in the 1940s and 50s, and it was something that they would send to a child under the age of 12, inviting them to a birthday party. They'd ask parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents for a child's birthday as well as their address. And a few weeks before their birthday, this arrived. Well, you couldn't miss it. The orange and the blue is quite vivid. And it said, Howard Johnson's wishes you a happy birthday and invites you to a birthday dinner. Well, what 12-year-old wouldn't want to go for a birthday dinner? The dinner was free. It included a birthday cake, lollipops, ice cream, and even balloons. <laughs> well, the child had to be accompanied by an adult, and it had to be on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, which were the slow nights. And it was said that this marketing ploy was something that had a 62% return, and it was an average of 11 people per birthday. So on the slow nights, they did extremely well. And on the back of these cards, addressed to parents and grandparents, it said to our patrons, we desire to maintain and as far as possible to improve in our high standard of food and service. The entire satisfaction of our patrons is of vital importance, and your opinion will be a helpful guide. Well, say you got there, and your clams were a little bit overdone and were rubbery. You might not be pleased, but if you had this card and you wrote a little note and put your name and telephone number, you would get a phone call from Howard Johnson. He wanted to know if people were displeased and how he could improve on his business. And if he actually thought it sounded plausible, people were given six free vouchers for dinners, something that many people today would actually give an eye tooth for, for somebody to listen to us. And in that way, it was a great success. But the foods Howard Johnson served were incredible. And seen here, these were Ipswich clams, as sweet as a nut. The company that provided them was Sofran Clam Company of Ipswich. And between 1936 and 1963, they had the sole concession to provide clams to Howard Johnson's. There were four brothers, and they were Greek immigrants from Kalamata. They came here with their parents in the late 19-teens. They lived in Ipswich, and they worked at the hosiery mills. But by the 1920s, they started a clam shucking shack that provided 
fresh clams. And they hired many women that didn't speak English. You can see most of them are Greek. And in that instance, they'd be paid according to the number of clams they shucked. The eldest of the brothers was George Sofran. He was really the brains of the business. After the women had actually shucked them and they were cleaned, they were put into one-gallon tins and then eventually sent by biplane to the various restaurant franchises. But during that period, the Ipswich River could only provide just so many clams. It wasn't a huge river. And people began to realize in some ways that, yes, they were as sweet as a nut. And, of course, a clam roll such as this, which was full-bellied clams on a toasted roll, was something that people absolutely adored. But during the late 40s, they couldn't provide enough clams. And they decided they would expand their production to Digby, Nova Scotia and Hilton Head, South Carolina. Now, these weren't the clams that one would get at the Ipswich River. They were hen clams, a much larger clam. And because they didn't really have a belly, they were cut into strips and deep fried. And those were called tender sweet fried clams. And Howard Johnson served in 1951 the first clam strips in America. <laughs> Seen here on the right-hand side, George uh, Sofran actually would sell the name Tender Sweet to Howard Johnson for $10,000. And as you can see, it not only had a plate of fried clams and French fries and coleslaw and rolls and butter at $1.35, but it was the best you could get. Howard Johnson also provided turkeys daily. Part of the agreement on the franchise was that you would roast six fresh turkeys daily. And seen here in an advertisement from the late 1960s, take a tip from Rudy Valley. How to succeed in carving a turkey without really trying. Number one, put the family in the car. Number two, head for the orange roof. And number three, order Howard Johnson's turkey special. At $1.49, this was fresh white turkey meat, real mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, gravy, and of course, peas and carrots, rolls and butter, was something almost as good as if it was made at home. People began to realize the variety of foods were always consistent. So whether the clams or the turkey or even the shrimp gumbo served in Maine tasted just like it did in Florida. And during that period, of course, they continued to expand the food for children by the 1960s, they did these little historical booklets. They were about 12 pages in length, and they might have the history of rocket science, the history of ancient Egypt, the history of Native Americans, or even things on the rubrics or even the metric system. And the children really did enjoy it. But in the middle was the menu. And after the child had placed his or her order, they could then sit down to read or play games. This was a game that actually would actually allow you to spell a word. And it says, try to print these numbered letters in the like numbered squares below. So if a T is number eight, and Y is number six, and I is number five, if you drew those letters down and you did it correctly, you would spell quality. Well, what child wouldn't be happy that he or she had actually spelled the word correctly but what was it with the parents and the grandparents? What else was Howard Johnson's other than quality? And the children really did learn these as things in some ways that must have been quite intriguing. But on the back of every one of these different historical books was a game that every child wanted to play. It was the Howard Johnson's ice cream game. And it says, check the popular flavors as you try them. And again, there are 28, and they go from vanilla to macaroon. And if you had everyone checked off, you got a free ice cream cone. Now, could you imagine your grandchildren wanted to play this every day, two or three times, in July and August? It was something that says, ask mom and dad to stop at a Howard Johnson's. Well, it really was quite important. In 1959, Howard Johnson, seen here looking at the logo, and this was the restaurant that was on the Southeast Expressway at Boston Street in Dorchester, he had actually made this company into not only a success, but the company was valued in 1959 at $750 million. 
he stepped down as president and handed over the business to his son Howard. And he became chairman of the board and treasurer of the company. And his son, seen here, who was well-educated, was supposedly well up to the task of taking over the multi-million dollar company. He was educated at Moses Brown in Providence, Milton Academy, Phillips Andover, Yale, and the Harvard Business School. When he took over the company in 1959, the company was not only well set, but with his education and background, one of the first things he did was to place the company onto the New York Stock Exchange. Now, you might like Howard Johnson's. You might buy a share of stock. It declared a dividend quarterly. But the idea was, between 1959 and the death of the founder in 1972, the family sold $1 billion worth of stock. And the stock was something that not only declared a dividend without fail, but it allowed the company to begin to change. And one of the first changes was to streamline all of the restaurants. The son Howard Howard Nims, an Atlanta, Georgia architect, and he created a one-story modernistic building, still with an orange roof, but on the left-hand side was the dining room, and on the right-hand side was the counter and stools, and directly in the center were facilities and the kitchen. They didn't differ from one city to the other, and they came with at least 100 parking spaces. This was something that cut down on an architectural cost of designing a new building for every new space. But the Sun, in some ways, was competing against other businesses. There were new fast food restaurants arising, and we might know them. Burger King, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they're truly fast food. But they could never combine, even combined, actually come up to the power of Howard Johnson's, even by 1965. But one company did. Did anybody remember the Red Coach Grill? Well, the Red Coach Grill started in 1937, fine steaks and seafood. Their red roof and stagecoach was the major feature of their business. And because they were giving Howard Johnson's a run for their money, the boy bought them out. He also bought out Mug and Muffin, and then he started the Ground Round in 1969. He was actually not reinvesting the money by that point in the business. He was working with people to actually create frozen food that could be kept at the commissary and delivered frozen, so when it was thawed, one would hope it had the same taste and consistency of fresh food. In fact, he worked with Jacques Pepin, the great French chef, who worked with him for 10 years at the Rigo Park Commissary. And this man actually worked on the frozen food division, but he also boned 100 turkeys daily, and he would make clam chowder to the tune of 150 gallons at a time. Well, in that instance, the company was also looking to update Sister Parish's uniforms. And the son, seen here with Miss Massachusetts, decided in that instance that they weren't going to go local. And Sister Hadley, Sister Parrish was still alive, but they decided to go to the House of Dior in Paris. Now, they created four prototypes of uniforms, and they were really quite lovely. But they decided to have all of the waitresses vote upon their choice which was somewhat demeaning. I'm sure they would have preferred a dollar a raise. But the whole aspect was these uniforms would eventually become this, seen in New Jersey. And again, they don't look very different at all than what Sister Hadley Parish had done back in 1937. But the aspect was the company, though it was beginning to totter, also had a very profitable side, which was the motels. Beginning in 1952, the founder, Howard Johnson, created the first motel in Savannah, Georgia. It was for people on the road going to Florida from New England who wanted someplace that was not only clean and accessible, but also had a restaurant adjacent to it. And by the period of 1975, there were over 775 motels throughout the United States. So restaurants and motels began to attract people of all walks of life, including 
this woman, does anybody recognize her? Well, she's leaving the all-you-could-eat fish fry at the Hyannis Rotary. The Howard Johnson restaurant there with Ethel on the left-hand side was a great place for a cup of coffee or simple lunch, but it truly was a good example that Howard Johnson attracted everyone. And many people realized that their 28 flavors of ice cream, the first premium ice cream beginning in 1928, was something that continued right through to the 1980s. And in some ways, seen here in 1972, Howard Deering Johnson and Howard Brennan Johnson actually share a scoop of ice cream, while this tablet that was actually placed on the site of the first Howard Johnson store, opened in September of 1925, was placed as a commemorative marker in a rectorate by Howard Johnson's through the courtesy of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority and the city of Quincy. In that instance, this was a major feature, and the company had grown tremendously. But when we think about the logo, this is one of the earliest and most recognizable aspects of the food industry in the United States. John Alcott created Simple Simon and the Pieman with the drooling dog that not only was, as I said, on every placemat, napkin, cup and saucer, but also on the neon signs. And as you see closely, the little dog's drool would actually have a neon light. So in that aspect, Howard Johnson's, how a Massachusetts soda fountain became an American icon, it chronicles a 20th century chain, a restaurant that went from Maine to Florida, from the East Coast to the West. But it's something in some ways, when we think of the food and ice cream, is a delicious memory from the past. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, why did they go out of business? Well, you have to read the book. <laughs> Howard Johnson, the son, was beginning to spend money recklessly. And he was also spending it in such a way that it wasn't reinvesting it. I don't know if you remember, but food began to go down. Frozen food in the late 60s and early 70s wasn't as well presented as fresh food. It was also the fact people began to perceive it as something where your grandparents would go for dinner. He thought he would circumvent that by creating the ground round. I don't know if people remember the ground round, but it was a hamburger, and they gave you a bowl of peanuts, and you could simply throw them on the floor. It was something that people thought a beer and a hamburger would be something that would circumvent it. Problem was, the company in some ways had lost its bearing. Howard Johnson took 40 years to build his company, but his son only took 10 years to destroy it. Whereas the father, when he stepped down in 1959 as president, and the company was worth $750 million, in 1981, the son offered the business that was bought by Imperial Group, a British conglomerate that owned pubs in the British Isles and hotels. They bought it for $135 million. So the company had failed tremendously. It was also the fact if one was a waitress and here you were voting on a uniform from Dior of Paris and rather than get a small raise, I think people felt somewhat that the man was not quite considerate. And I think in a lot of ways, as I've spoken to other employees when I wrote this book, that in some ways he was actually running an empire for his own personal use rather than that of the, the employees. Any other questions? Please. It's, it's interesting because I know two other stories where the son takes over and they just destroy the business. But uh, my question is, in Yarmouth, they're, they're up until a couple years ago, I think, there's a, there was a Howard Johnson's motel. In, is it still there? No. The other thing was, I mean, I could go on, for, we'd be here until midnight. When they sold the company to Imperial Group, Imperial Group immediately sold all of the motels to Marriott Corporation. Marriott Corporation then began to break them out. And eventually they were bought by Wyndham Corporation. Wyndham owns the motels that you see. That They even use the logo, Howard Johnson's. 
no connection to Howard Johnson's. They were owned by Wyndham. Will you write a book about friendlies and how they went out of business? God, you sound like my publisher. <laughs> they said to me, would you do a book on Wendy, uh, friendlies? And I said, friendlies? I don't know anything about them. Of course, I didn't know anything about Howard Johnson. I think in a lot of ways, you know, we're all about the same age and we think, you know, what has gone out? That's why I'm writing books on Howard Johnson's, Jordan Marsh, Baker Chocolate. I'm doing a book right now on S.S. Pierce. So you say to yourself, I mean, the things we knew, they're part of our lives or our parents. And I think sometimes Friendlies is a great idea. If I live long enough, I will. He's, my publisher is in London and he's booking three and four a year. I already did five this year and I'm working on a book on the Freedom Trail right now, which I've got to finish by the end of the year. But I love doing it. I, I like it because it sounds terrible. But I have a Facebook page called Lost Boston. And I encourage people, you know, to share ideas. So I'll, I'll put a picture of uh, Howard Johnson's. And then somebody will say, oh, I'm blah, 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 whatever. And I'm like, hmm, this is good. Then I email them and I say, can I talk to you? And I think in a lot of ways, my books, I'm not saying they're a great success, but I'm very proud of them. They, they encompass our shared memories. It's not all me. And doing research that you footnote, so boring. But if you do it, and I talk to you about it, which you lived, it makes it all the more important because it's part of our history. So these are really kind of fun, and I've done a lot on the neighborhoods of Boston too, but I'll think about friendlies. If you give me an ice cream cone. <laughs> Any other, please. I'm just going to make mention, you yes. know my family had a Howard Johnson's, and it was in 1938 that they opened it. And this gentleman asked what possessed them to open a Howard Johnson's, two maiden ladies. Right. And you just introduced Cotter. Mm -hmm. Irving Cotter. Yeah. And that's how the relationship was. I never knew it until now. Wow. Edith yeah. Cotter. But probably his sister married a Doherty who was close to my family. Oh, and wow. That was it, yeah. You know, this is the thing. I, I gave this lecture at La Salle, which is a retirement community, and there was a woman sitting in the front row. I mean, she was beautifully dressed, her hair, she must have been 90, and a pocketbook. And they said, oh, this is Miss Larson. I'm like, oh, hello, Miss Larson. Well, it turned out she was George Larson's daughter. And she was so proud that her husband, her husband, her father, had started this Howard Johnson, but she didn't have a photograph of him with Howard Johnson. So, you know, these are the things that connect and they make history fun. You know, I've been teaching history 30 years, Urban College of Boston for 25, and I've been at BU Metropolitan College for five. And, you know, these students, I want to delude myself. They're taking the course because they're fascinated with history. They need the four humanities credits. But I want them to have fun with it. So we do things. I give them 25 topics they can choose from for a final paper. There's sports in there. There's architecture. There's fashion design, whatever. And they work with me. And I get some papers sometimes that are really well done. But they have no idea who Howard Johnson was. They have no idea about Jordan Marsh. And if we don't preserve these things, not only ourselves, but photographs of family, stories about Aunt Maud buying her dress at Jordan Marsh for her wedding. Uh, my blazers all came from the Husky shop at Jordan Marsh. I was so proud of that, not at the time, but. But I think that's the type of thing, and I always look at them and I say, how do you weave it into a story that makes it fun? So that's what history is about. Please, how are you? Hi. Um, I'll put a plug in for your books that you brought to sell, because they make wonderful gifts. Um, we have a, a brother who lives in San Francisco, and he's always calling home, how are things back home? And so when I send him for his birthday or Christmas one of the books, he's just engaged in it. Thank so think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, they're $20 either cash or check, but they ask things in a lot of ways. As I mentioned, I have a book on the other red line. It talks about Scully Square and the combat zone. I've got some great photographs. A book on the history of Halloween in Boston. And then also things that 
talk about the Great Boston Fire of 1872. So they're, they're very broad-based topics, but they also go into detail that it's many things that I use in my teaching courses and have fun with it. Any other questions? Please. Just a couple of things. One, you showed the postcard for the birthday thing. Yes. I have a sister who's just within three weeks of me in age, a few years, but... Um, every other year we'd have a choice, so she she would always pick going to the beach for her birthday, all right? But then that meant the next year I could have my party wherever I wanted, so I always had my party at Howard Johnson's because the card came, all right? Really? And I always had the Luna Patty Burger, which was a little round That's hamburger right. yes. with the peas and the um, mashed potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have the card? Probably somewhere, but... Yeah. <laughs> this is I, mean, I still have the original Nantasket Beach token. Oh, really? How nice. No, I think that's the that's fun. I mean, I find things not that I clean very often, but I uh, I said, well, geez, I found things the other day. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that was here. So, well, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it.